<clears throat> All right, moving on to Revelation 4 through 9, where we see the beginning of the wrath of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not the wrath of Satan on the earth. This is the wrath of Jesus Christ, who has come to judge the earth. <clears throat> First, we see in chapters four and five, um, two of my favorite chapters in scripture until Revelation 19, we see the scene of the heavenly throne room of God. Now, we get glimpses of this um, through the other prophets, but this is the most time we ever spend in the throne room of God um, through the scriptures. And when we arrive there, uh, we see that there is one sitting on the throne. Uh, now, this throne is the universal throne. It's not the throne of this earth, uh, but this is the throne on which God has always sat and will always sit, the throne that has never been in question, um, who sits on it. Um, in Isaiah, uh, can't remember what chapter, 13, uh, Satan says, Satan has five I will statements, and uh, those all seek to elevate himself to the throne of God above the clouds of God. Um, he wants uh, this throne that God sits on, but this throne cannot be sat on by anyone but God. And it's also important then that when Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, he sat at the right hand of God on this throne. Now, Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of David during the millennial kingdom. Right now, he sits on his father's throne, uh, he will sit on his own throne during the millennial kingdom, and then those will merge together. And we'll look at that when we get to Revelation 21. Around the throne is a rainbow. In fact, we have um, emerald colors, we have sapphire colors, and we have uh, ruby colors all around the throne. We've got red, blue, and green all around. And this, uh, this rainbow is either different variations of green, or it could be... Um, it could be all different colors. Uh, it's not really that clear in the Greek uh, language. Then surrounding the throne are 24 elders. Uh, we identified these as um, the raptured church. This is probably one of the most controversial points in all of Revelation. Few people really agree on this. Um, for me, it's, it's really a slam dunk uh, that these are the... the uh, the rapture church. The only reason not to find them being the church is if you have a presupposition that the church has not been raptured yet. Um, if you come at this with that presupposition, um, you can find arguments against this. Uh, but if you come to this text with no presupposition, uh, these are clearly identified with the same elements and markers as the churches just one chapter earlier, um, such as their white garments, their golden crowns. These are things that are that or the golden crowns especially never describe angels, uh, which is usually what these are try what some try to attribute these as. Uh, moreover, in front of the throne of God, there are the seven flames of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Uh, in Isaiah 11, uh, verse 2, those are identified for us, and it's it's the Holy Spirit itself, but we get uh, five genitive forms here that says it is the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, of counsel, of strength, of knowledge, and of the fear of the Lord. Uh, these are the seven um, sevenfold spirits of God, and it's just the completeness of his spirit um, is essentially what that is pointing to, pointing towards. Uh, there are four living creatures. Uh, this is kind of a clunky translation from the Greek. It's just one little three-letter word, zoe, which means life, um, but living things um, is the idea. It's a participle um, in a noun form, just the living ones. Um, so these four living creatures seem to be something different than the angels, just like the 24 elders. They are distinguished from the rest of the angels. Um, and these four living creatures are in the form of a lion, a calf, a man, and an eagle. We have the same uh, four creatures carrying the throne of God um, in the book of Ezekiel. And then finally, in chapter 5, verse 1, uh, we see a scroll with seven seals. And we identify that as the title deed to this earth. That deed, that throne, which is in question, uh, the, 
the throne that was given up by Adam when he submitted to the words of the serpent rather than to the words of God, and this throne of the earth that Jesus Christ himself will sit on as the theocratic administrator, the rightful ruler of this earth. Remember, God intended man to rule over this earth, and a man will rule over this earth, and that man will be Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that is why we have an angel in chapter 5 question, who is worthy to open this book and break its seals? Uh, because Jesus Christ alone is worthy to open the book. Uh, John begins to cry when he sees that there is no one standing there worthy to open uh, this scroll because he knows what it is. He knows that this is the rulership over the earth, but he is not worried so much about the earth, I think, as he is about God's glory because God must be victorious in the same realm in which he was seemingly defeated. If this earth passes away before a man of God rules over this earth as his intermediary, then Satan has been victorious, and that is impossible. So John is sitting here looking at what he thinks to be the impossible, uh, where it appears that there is no one worthy to open the scroll. Now, from the midst of the throne, uh, we see one described as the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and a lamb standing as if slain. Now, this all points back to the promise given to uh, promise given to Eve of a uh, of a seed that would conquer the serpent's seed, uh, to the promises given to Abraham of a seed that would come from him, uh, the promises given to Jacob that were then passed down to Judah, and it said this, uh, the scepter would never pass away from Judah. And then that promise was reiterated to David, uh, that his throne would be forever. And then finally, we see all of that fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and we see it fulfilled in the suffering servant, the lamb who came to die for the salvation of the world. This lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are both identified for us as the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is and is a part of the Trinity where he is on the throne of God and his seven horns and seven eyes, uh, just like the seven flames before the throne are the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. So Jesus Christ being the worthy savior, uh, the worthy one who can take this scroll uh, does precisely that. He takes the scroll from the hand of God. Now notice this scroll does not belong to Satan right now, although he is the ruler of this world. He does not hold the title deed to this earth. God alone holds the title deed, and he will give it to whom he will. So at the moment, Jesus Christ takes this scroll, uh, which is really the culmination of all of history, at the moment, Jesus Christ takes this scroll from the hand of God. Uh, heaven erupts into worship. Heaven erupts into song. In fact, there are 14 different songs in Revelation. And five of those 14 happen in these two chapters. Uh, in, verse, or in chapters 4, we have the four living creatures singing a worship song to God the Father. And then in verse 11, we have the 24 elders singing a song to God the Father. In chapter 5, which focuses more on Christ, we get the 24 elders and the four living creatures together singing to the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ. And then they are joined by the angels around them. And then in 513, we have every single creature of the entire created universe um, singing to God the Father and the Lamb together. Uh, we won't go through all the rest of these, but we get songs from the tribulation martyrs, more songs from the angels, 24 elders, and the four living creatures. Uh, the 24 elders, which is us, the church, um, sing quite often throughout this, uh, this book. We get the tribulation saints, those who are alive on the earth in chapter 15. That, when we come back from our break, uh, will be one of the first things we see. We have the angels singing, the altar singing, which is going to be an interesting one we'll go through. Uh, the great multitude, those are the martyrs out of the tribulation. They will sing a song. Uh, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, again, will, um, will conclude at the return of Jesus Christ. And then the great multitude, again, singing to God the Father. 
So here's a little sample of, uh, of that worship music in chapter five. Revelation 5, 9 through 10 reads, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Now, all of this worship in chapter 4 and 5 speaks of the worthiness of God the Father and of the Lamb. And why we need to be reminded of their worthiness is because they are about to release judgment on this earth. This is the song in recognition that the wrath that is about to be poured out on this earth is just. That God, being the creator of man, is just in bringing judgment on man and the whole world. And Jesus Christ, being the redeemer of mankind and the world, um, has every right to bring judgment on those who have not received his free gift of redemption. And then the judgments begin. In chapter 6, uh, we get the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments before the midpoint of the tribulation. And the first four of the seal judgments are distinguished from the last three. So the first four are the four horsemen. We get a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. The first one has a rider who has a bow, a crown, and he comes conquering. Now, most will note that this bow does not have arrows. Um, that could be uh, intended to mean bow and arrows. So I, I don't know that that's the best argument here. Um, but it does seem that he comes with political power rather than um, war power. And some will even try to identify this as Jesus Christ because he comes riding a white horse. And in chapter 19, Jesus Christ comes riding a white horse. And I think that's precisely the point. This man riding a white horse is going, to be, is going to come attempting to appear as much as possible like a Messiah. But I think we fall right into the trap or the trick of the Antichrist if we try to identify him as Jesus Christ here in chapter 6. So I do believe this is the advent, uh, perhaps not of the Antichrist, the man, but of the Antichrist system over which the man, the Antichrist, will, uh, will reside. Uh, it's not certain that he will be identifiable prior to the midpoint of the tribulation. There will probably be good indications who he is, but his confirmation um, is not until he is indwelled by Satan at the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, the red horse comes with a great sword to take away the peace from the earth, um, and it says that this, uh, this red horse will cause man to fight man. So this red horse uh, brings war with him. The black horse brings scales and uh, what looks like controlled inflation, where we have wheat and barley being uh, raised up to day wages, where you can, uh, for one day's wage, you can only get enough food for one person to eat. Um, and then it says not to damage the oil or the wine. Um, so it appears as though the rich may not um, struggle at this point, but the poor will. It looks like controlled inflation, um, perhaps to squeeze out the lower classes. Um, again, this looks like it's all under the control of the Antichrist who is going to come as a political ruler. The pale horse, uh, the pale horse and the white horse are the only ones whose rider is specifically identified. Uh, or actually the white horse's rider isn't identified, but he's identified as having a rider. So is the pale horse, and the pale horse's rider is specifically identified for us as death. That is probably death personified here, uh, followed by Hades, the location of the dead, uh, following behind it. Uh, this uh, judgment, the pale horse, is given power to kill one-fourth of mankind. Uh, we assumed for the sake of numbers, I think that there would be 6 billion left after the rapture. Now, that could be 6 billion left. It could be 1 billion left. We really have no idea. Uh, doesn't make any sense to speculate, but just for the sake of numbers, uh, we had 1.5 billion people dying in this judgment um, by sword, by famine, by pestilence, and by wild beasts. Um, so this will be the worst terror that this earth has ever seen to that point will be this uh, pale horse, but unfortunately, it's not the worst one uh, that will be seen uh, in these last seven years. 
the fifth and sixth seals are pretty unique seals uh, or pretty unique judgments that is uh, because the first one uh, really is more like uh, laying down the the uh, the sentence the the reason for their judgment coming um, this is like the gavel coming down uh, we see these martyrs beneath the altar these are martyrs that come out of the tribulation period it's probably not all martyrs from all time but all those who have been martyred um, since the rapture of the church um, and it will be a time of intense persecution but they ask this very poignant question and in fact we've excuse me, we've come back to this point multiple times throughout our study because they cry out asking, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In chapter 14, which we did a couple of weeks ago, we saw finally the announcement that the time has come, um, and that is immediately preceding uh, the events of Armageddon, uh, which is the final battle of the tribulation period. So these martyrs are told to rest just a little while longer, uh, and their rest is just a little while. We, we don't know exactly how close to the midpoint of the tribulation this will be, but I think these first five or first six um, judgments really do take up the majority of the first half of the tribulation, and the trumpet judgments would be pretty rapid uh, just before the midpoint. And then the sixth seal uh, is a lot of different events happening all at once. We've got a great earthquake, which to that point will be the worst earthquake the world has ever seen. But again, it is not the worst one that it will see. Uh, we see uh, intensifying judgments all through Revelation, where we see certain judgments that seem to be repeated. But uh, if you take careful note, their intensity grows um, quite a bit by the end, where this is just a great earthquake. Um, the sun will turn black and the moon will turn red. This might be volcanic activity, but it may just be simple supernatural um, judgments where the Lord turns the sun black and uh, turns the moon red. There will be meteorites, falling stars. Uh, the sky will split open like a scroll. Mountains and islands will be moved. Now, this is one, again, that's pointed to often and said, See, this is the same judgment that's going to happen later in chapter 16 and 17. Um, but there it doesn't say that the islands are moved. It says that the islands flee away, that they disappear completely. This one is just an earthquake big enough to shake the islands and mountains and perhaps even move them um, out of their geological uh, position. But they will all sink. The islands will sink. The mountains will disappear um, at the final great earthquake. Uh, and the result of this and the, um, the purpose of all these rounds of judgments and why they grow in intensity is because as mankind sees this judgment coming down, um, there's still an offer of salvation. In fact, all the way up to the end, they are still offered um, the ability to repent. Even uh, the Church of Thyatira, we could use as an example uh, where the time had run out for most of them, but there were still people in that church uh, that could repent of their deeds um, and not lose their rewards. So, so the same goes here with the salvation of mankind, that they could repent at any time during this tribulation, but instead we see uh, in large portions the opposite response, where when faced with these judgments, rather than repenting, they double down and they cry out for death rather than salvation. <clears throat> then we get an interlude. There are five different interludes um, in the book of Revelation. Other than that, it is chronological. Um, and this interlude simply goes back to, uh, actually, it looks at the whole book um, kind of in a whole, I think where we get these 144 sealed towards the beginning, and then we have the multitude um, from the tribulation uh, viewed kind of proleptically, where it's the entire book um, looking at all the martyrs that will come out of the tribulation period. But these 144,000 who are sealed are probably sealed very early on um, in the tribulation. The seal is a seal of protection, 
And it's not a seal that all believers will receive, uh, but 144,000 Jews from each of the 12 tribes of Israel um, that are sealed for a specific purpose. And that purpose is probably uh, to share the gospel, although that is not specifically detailed in the scripture what they are to do. Uh, but you can imagine once the church is raptured, uh, the only ones left on this earth who will have a knowledge of the scriptures are those who studied it but did not believe it. And the Jews are the ones who have studied enough scripture but have not believed in the requirement of salvation, which is uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, resurrection, and ascension. Um, so those who have not believed in Jesus Christ but who do believe in the Bible uh, will be primed and ready to accept Christ when these judgments begin. So the first converts after the rapture will probably be Jews in large numbers who will realize that they missed the train. Uh, 144,000 of those will be sealed for a specific duty during the tribulation, and they will be divinely protected in order to carry out that duty. Uh, this is not a seal of salvation. They must already be saved in order to receive this seal. And it is not a seal of uh, their promised inheritance in the millennial kingdom. These are both options that are tossed around by people, but it, it doesn't work at all to say that these are uh, a seal of either salvation or rewards. Because of these 12 tribes of Israel, the name Dan and the name Ephraim is missing. The name Manasseh is also missing but Joseph is put in place of that, and Levi is added into these 12. Now, it still makes up 12. There are 12 names listed, but in the millennial kingdom, in chapter 22 uh, of, or 20, 21 of Revelation, we see 12 different names uh, written where Dan is included, Ephraim is included, Manasseh instead of Joseph is written, and Levi is not included. And that's because not all uh, the tribes of Israel do receive an inheritance in the millennial kingdom. The tribe of Levi does not because they are an inheritance of God. Uh, <clears throat> but Dan and Ephraim have not lost their inheritance in the millennial kingdom. They have only not been selected for service um, here during the tribulation period because of their uh, deeds when they were uh, when they were a nation uh, prior to the advent of Christ, Dan and Ephraim brought in most of the judgment on Israel. Um, so we looked at different verses in First and Second Kings that point out Dan and Ephraim as, as really the gate to idolatry uh, for the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Manasseh was substituted for Joseph, probably stylistically here. Um, these 144,000 in chapter 7 are distinguished from the great multitude um, in that they say specifically the 144,000 are Jews, and very specifically that the multitude um, from the tribulation are from every nation, every tribe, every people, and every tongue. So this is not the same group of people. Um, they are standing before the throne of God and of the Lamb. Uh, that places them in heaven, not on the earth whereas the 144,000 are on the earth here in the tribulation for a specific duty. These, this multitude is identified as the martyrs who have been given rest from their weary and toil here on this earth. Um, and again, we look at um, every time a believer dies during this tribulation period, it is looked at as a mercy uh, because no one wants to be here during that time. It's, it's not something we as a church should hope for either. Thankfully, um, we do not uh, go through this judgment. The seventh seal um, is then broken uh, at the beginning of chapter eight, and we see silence in heaven for half an hour. That silence, I mean, think of a half an hour of silence. It sounds like a short period of time, but um, just imagine everyone waiting with bated breath for an entire half an hour because of the intensity of what is about to come upon the world. Uh, in Revelation 7, 15 to 17, here's, uh, again, just a sampling of a verse uh, from that chapter that points towards the rest of these martyrs. It says, For this reason they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. 
they will hunger no longer nor thirst anymore, nor will the sun beat down on them nor any heat for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. So it really is uh, much to be preferred than to uh, spend out the rest of, or to uh, last to the end of the tribulation. That being said, if uh, a Christian finds themselves here in the tribulation period, they should be about the, the Father's work, just as we should be here, um, where we are not in this much persecution, but where we see persecution rising. Rather than uh, praying to escape it by death, uh, we should pray to uh, be used of the Lord. Now, we can definitely pray for the rapture to happen, but until that happens, uh, we want to be about his business here on this earth, sharing the gospel that will save our friends and family and loved ones uh, from these terrible judgments. All right, then we immediately on the tail of the seven seal judgments. In fact, the seventh seal judgment is the opening of the, uh, the trumpet judgments. So here we get... Um, multiple judgments where one third of all of something is destroyed. Later on, we're going to get, again, judgments that look like repeats, but rather than destroying just one third, they destroy all of that thing. Um, and that is probably a, a couple of years after these judgments have taken place. The uh, fifth one of these trumpet judgments seems uh, particularly severe. Um, and we're going to look at that as well as uh, the three woes. That is one of the three woes. And then we're going to look at the demonic army that will kill one third of uh, mankind. <clears throat> so these trumpet judgments, uh, they are after the, uh, after the half an hour of silence in heaven, we see an angel uh, who takes the incense from the altar and mixes it together with the prayers of the saints from the golden altar. That is the martyrs from the fifth seal. He mixes their prayers with the incense from the altar and throws it down on the earth. So we see their cry of how long, Lord. Uh, that cry is intimately intertwined with these judgments uh, from the Lord. So these judgments are first hail, fire, and blood, uh, and that falls on a third of the earth, the trees, and the grass, and burns um, one third of the earth. Uh, the second is a burning mountain that falls into the ocean that destroys one third of the sea life and one third of all the ships. Uh, the third seal, or the third trumpet rather, is uh, the star wormwood falling into one third of the rivers making the water bitter so that whoever drinks that bitter water will die. The fourth is the sun, moon, and the stars being struck so that they're one-third darker. Now, this might be that one-third of the stars are missing or simply that they become one-third less intense, uh, which is more likely. Uh, then, at the end of these four trumpet judgments, uh, we see a very... Uh, we see... Uh, I think it's an eagle, right? Yes, an eagle flying in mid heaven, and he's crying out, uh, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So we have three woes, uh, and we've got three trumpet, uh, trumpets left here. Uh, but those three woes uh, are identified with the next trumpet, um, and in fact, it might be the next two trumpets that are that first woe, um, the demonic swarm and the demonic army. Um, but the other two woes, interestingly enough, do not fall with the trumpets. Um, we get the last sign of Jonah in chapter 11, and that is identified as a woe. And then we have the fall of Satan from heaven where he falls to this earth and is particularly angry because he knows his time is short. Um, that is another time where um, a woe is pronounced on the earth. So there are three woes um, on the earth uh, in the book of Revelation uh, that are coming up. And those are three points that we want to, uh, to uh, pay attention to. Now, the sign of Jonah, 
that second woe that we're going to uh, look at actually goes all the way back to Matthew, uh, Matthew 12, 38 to 40. Uh, and this is after Israel has formally rejected Jesus Christ as the king, and he pronounces a woe on the Pharisees uh, because they are asking for a sign. And he says they're only going to get one more sign from him. He says, uh, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He doesn't do any more public signs after this point, uh, at least not chronologically. He doesn't perform any more signs for the purpose of identifying himself as the king. Uh, but he does do this, uh, this sign that he says he will, the sign of resurrection. And he does it three times. He resurrects Lazarus from the tomb. He resurrects himself. And then finally, he resurrects his two witnesses uh, in, the, uh, in the midpoint of the tribulation. So the final sign of Jonah, resurrection, which points back to Jesus Christ, um, is given to this final generation of Israel as well. All right. And the fifth trumpet judgment is the opening of the abyss. The opening of this abyss is uh, quite horrific and perhaps one of the better known judgments in uh, Revelation. When this pit is open, smoke and scorpion-like locusts emerge from it. Uh, only the 144,000 are unharmed by this judgment. It says those who are sealed uh, are unharmed, sealed on their foreheads. Um, that is how the 144,000 were sealed. So again, this is not speaking of sealed by the Holy Spirit for salvation, but this is sealed for the purpose of spreading the gospel. And in fact, um, one might be more inclined to accept the gospel of these 144,000 if they are in danger of, um, of being harmed by these horrible locusts. But these locusts will not have any power to kill. They will only have power to torment. That might be even worse uh, than death here uh, because many of them are crying out for death. Uh, they won't be allowed to die during this point, and that itself is a judgment. Uh, these locusts have a unique appearance that many try to identify specifically what they are. Um, I think they're going to be exactly what they're identified as. We're not going to be able to identify them as something like a helicopter, which was a really popular one a couple of years ago. Uh, but they're going to look like armored horses. They're going to be um, having the appearance of a crown. They will have the appearance of a face like a human. Um, their hair will look like women's hair. Their teeth will look like lion's teeth. It looks like they're wearing a breastplate. Um, and their wings sound like chariots. Now, he uses this particle hos a lot in the Greek, which means like. So it's like this, like this, like this, like this, but almost nothing does he say it is exactly this, except for locusts. Uh, so they are probably most uh, closely aligned with locusts, probably small like locusts. Uh, and he's trying his best to, uh, to describe something that he himself has never seen before. Um, so these, these uh, elements of their description are him trying to round out a picture of these, um, of these creatures, which we've never seen before. To me, they kind of sound like devil fairies, like they just sound like terrible little creatures that are uh, definitely doing the bidding of, um, of God, because this is the wrath of God. Uh, but they are still demonic creatures. They are acting, um, they're acting out the will of God, although they are not godly creatures. They are created by him and thus come under his dominion. These stingers will uh, have the power to, uh, to give extreme pain for five months, um, five months of pain without the relief of death uh, would be terrible and this it sounds like debilitating pain they are ruled by the angel of the abyss whose name is apollyon or abaddon which means destroyer in greek and hebrew apollyon is greek abaddon is hebrew or is, yeah, is hebrew um, both mean destroyer and then this is identified as the first of those three woes <clears throat> 
and then we have the uh, final trumpet judgment, except for the seventh trumpet judgment, which opens up the bold judgments, which we still have not seen in our text from uh, chapters eight until, or chapter nine until chapter 15, uh, we have three interludes. Um, but here we've got one third dying from a demonic army. Uh, this is said to be the angels bound at the Euphrates uh, being released. So this is not a human army of 200 million. This is a demonic army of 200 million uh, that have been uh, that have been captured and uh, held at bay for millennia will be released for this purpose. Their appearance, they're gonna be red, purple, and yellow. Um, they use what, uh, the color of brimstone, hyacinth, and flames, I think. So that's basically red, purple, and yellow. Um, they're going to be, have armored riders. Their heads will look like lions. Uh, smoke and flames will come out of their mouths and their tails will, uh, will be like the bite of serpents. To me, this sounds a lot like dragons. I know people uh, I probably would get called crazy for saying that, but I'd be willing to be called crazy for saying that. Um, I think these are some sort of demonic dragon. Uh, and I think that might be where we get legends and myths of dragons from. Um, <clears throat> I mean, these are coming out of Asia, so who knows? Um, but once again, we see that surviving mankind is unrepentant. Rather than these judgments turning them towards salvation, uh, they turn them back towards themselves and they cry out for death rather than salvation. Thank you.